Good morning and welcome. I'm Jason Germay, president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, and really excited about today's event. I want to kind of share a little bit of why, and then we will uh, introduce our guest. So look, one reason that um, I'm excited to be here is that we're just kind of curious people, and this is fascinating. I mentioned to Sam that usually when I get to do these interviews, I know what the questions are, but I also kind of have a sense of what the answers are. Absolutely no clue whatsoever. So. You know, for me, this is kind of a moment of you know, personal growth and discovery. This set of issues, though, is also one of the places in a divided country where we actually believe that there can be meaningful progress made in the next few years. And um, you know, it's true that a lot of the issues we work on are already kind of pre-entrenched, right? We do a lot of work on climate and immigration and health care. This is not a tribal issue yet. The challenge is nobody understands it. The benefit is nobody understands it, right? So we are at this kind of formative moment where we have a chance to kind of set out constructive frameworks. And of course, the risk is people kind of panic and set out destructive frameworks. So that's really why we're here. So tremendous benefit to opportunity to introduce Sam Bankman Fried, who you all know is the CEO and founder of FTX. Just a quick bio. So Sam graduated uh, from MIT with a degree in physics. Like many people of his generation, he bounced around a little. He tried his hand as a Wall Street trader, a short stint, interestingly, at the Center for uh, Effective Altruism, tested his entrepreneurial skills with a quant firm he founded called Alameda Research, and then basically he kind of found his first job, um, creating an organization designed to disrupt global finance and change the fundamental ways human beings interact with one another. And I often say to the you know, staff here, sometime in your first decade, just like kind of hunker, spend three or four or five years at a job. And so Sam, I'm really eager to see what happens when you kind of settle in and kind of you know, get, your, get your footing. Um, three things just to kind of set this out I want to talk about. Some basic just level setting questions for me and the rest of you. I want to talk a little bit about kind of a lot of the challenges and some sense of what the kind of issues and vision you have might be, and then really think about the future. This is a very active moment. Uh, Sam is not just hanging out with us here today. Uh, just about every regulatory agency in town is throwing a grappling hook at this issue and trying to uh, ascertain and claim its space, so we're, we'll get there. All right, so three 
basic questions. We all kind of have our Genesis mythology. Like, how did this happen? How did you get interested in cryptocurrency? What was the inspiration to found FTX? Just like, where, where did you come from? Yeah, so I, I mean, prior to that, I was trading ETFs on Wall Street. And the, the sort of theory there when I started was um, I basically, I, okay, maybe taking one step back, actually. Uh, in college, I went to a bunch of charities I liked and said, what can I do to, for you guys? Like, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. Like, I don't think I, I can be out on the streets leafleting. I don't know if that's what I'm good at. I actually tried it once, and it is not what I'm good at. Um, so I actually do know that's not what I'm good at. Um, and, and said, you know, what can I do? And they said, we want your money, not your time. Like, you know, maybe. maybe they were honest. Yeah, yeah they're, they're pretty honest. I, I, think, I think I may have gotten a B minus, maybe a B for sort of like, you know, leafleting, but not, not, not anything better than that. Um, but they said, look, you know, physics, MIT, I don't know, maybe go to Wall Street. Um, you could probably donate enough for us to hire multiple people. So I was doing that for, for about three years at, at Jane Street Capital. Actually, I, I, it, was, it was very fun. It was, it was like, I had a great time there um, doing arbitrage, basically, in international ETFs. And the basic shtick there is like, you got like this fund, which owns a lot of stocks, uh, the stocks are all over the world. Some of them haven't traded for 12 hours. How do you figure out what this fund is worth? Um, uh, I left because I basically decided that probably there was something that I should be doing with my life. Uh, I had a lot of ideas that might or might not have been the thing. I just like, listed out 12 things. They all sound kind of compelling. And I was like, boy, I should like try these out. And there's only one way to figure out if, if you know, any of these are actually going to catch fire. Um, so did you have like some pets.com and some, you know? That's right, gerbils in particular uh -huh. was what I was thinking was sort of the untested market. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, so anyway, shortly after leaving, I, I, I sort of like poked around crypto and I had no idea what a blockchain was. I didn't know what a Bitcoin was. Like I couldn't have explained to you like the relationship between a block, a blockchain, a Bitcoin, like what is Ethereum or ETH or are those the same thing? Who knows? Um, there were tickers. I was used to tickers, like, you know, EEM. I know that ticker. It's an emerging market ETF. Turns out on these exchanges, the tickers, they're BTC and ETH and XRP and other things, but whatever, there's numbers on a screen. And there was arbitrage to do. Um, you know, you basically, you'd look at, like, Coinbase and Bitstamp, two U.S. crypto exchanges, and look at the Bitcoin markets. And Bitcoin would be priced at, you know, $3,000 on one of them and $3,100 on the other. And in theory, there's, there, you know, you just make money, buy on one, sell on the other. Um, so, so I sort of saw that, and the numbers naively were big enough. You could sort of, you know, pencil out, like, how much, in theory, you can make doing arbitrage. Or it was big enough that I felt like it was fake. Like, the, the numbers are actually implausibly big. Um, I, I think I got to, like, a million dollars a day mm -hmm. that you seemed like you could make doing this um, with extremely naive strategies that, like, you know, and, and so I was like, all right, 90% chance is just dumb, whatever. But, like, it's worth the day to, like, confirm that this data is not real. Um, and it turned out half the data was fake, but half of it was real. It turned out, like, a lot of those trades did exist as I just dove in and started doing it. And, um, and again, I, I, this was not, for me, a crypto moment. This is not, like, a blockchain moment. I did not know what they were. Um, uh, this was just, like... Apparently, there was a new thing I could trade that had, like, bigger arbitrages than the other things. Um, and, you know, sort of dove into creating what became Alameda Research. With that backdrop um, of, I, uh, you know, seeing it as, like, a way to make money and donate money, not a way to, I don't know, financial market structure or anything like that. Um, over the course of the year that I spent trading, though, I learned a lot about crypto and a lot about financial markets. Um, I was embarrassed about some of the things I, I learned. I was embarrassed that I traded for three years without learning them, in retrospect. Um, but over that year, um, it sort of set the stage for, for, you know, the realizations that led me to create FTX. That's, that really helps me understand you. <laughs> so just a, one more or a couple more sentences on the distinction between the idea of an exchange and all yeah. the crypto products that people are familiar yeah. with. Yeah. Well, it, and that was one of the things I had to grapple with, is it, what, one of the first things that became clear is that the word exchange means different things in different contexts. Actually, in different countries, it means different things. The company that you would call an exchange in one country, you might call a broker 
in another country or a clearinghouse in a third country. They're actually very different businesses. And they, like, but I mean, it's just like basically mistranslations to some extent, but also just market structure is different. And in fact, if you look at the market structure between commodities and securities in the United States, it's a bit different. Um, and one thing that trading crypto forced me to do was accept the fact that I didn't know what all these words actually meant and learn that. And, you know, at Gene Street, if I want to buy a stock, uh, I think FF, you press F twice and then enter. That was how you do it. And do you use a broker? I don't know, use those three keys, right? Like, how does it settle or clear? I don't know. You press those three keys, and then, like, on this little scrolling, like, list of trades, you see the trade. And you're like, great, I did the trade. Like, I, I, I had no answer to anything about what was going on the back end. So what does exchange mean in the crypto context? In the crypto context, traditionally, and there's some, some exchanges that are slightly different, but here's sort of, like, the classic answer to this is it's the centralized trading infrastructure. So an exchange, it's not a token, it's not an asset, it's not a thing that you can buy or sell, um, and it's not a trading firm. It doesn't like take positions, it doesn't you know, try to make money buying or selling itself, um, but it is all of the infrastructure that you need as a third party to buy or sell a digital asset. And so what that means is that, you know, what is FTX? FTX, it's a matching engine, so a place where bids and offers cross. It's also a website and a mobile app that connects to that matching engine. It's a custody service for the digital assets mm -hmm. um, that people are trading on that platform. It's a risk engine for futures contracts that trade there. Um, so you could describe it if you wanted to as sort of looking kind of like what in securities parlance we might call a an exchange plus a broker plus a different version of clearing infrastructure or a clearinghouse and marketplace and maybe FCM in sort of commodities parlance. It's a full stack infrastructure product, but it's not like a PFOF like, you know, sort of single dealer, um, uh, you know, dark pool type thing. It's a open agnostic order book that third parties are trading it in you know, with each other on. All right, so Sam and I had about 90 seconds um, in kind of prepping for this over a Danish. And the one thing he said was, like, just don't ask me these, like, stupid easy questions because he's tired of those. So um, we're going to now talk about the challenges, right, some of yeah. the problems. Um, but before we really dig in there, just talk to me not about the near-term, you know, interesting things. Yep. Like, you could, like, what's the big idea here? Like, well, you know, in, in 15 years when you're like, okay, I did it, yep. what would you like to have seen the the world, the country, what, yeah. what do you want to see happen? I'm going to put aside my company for a second and, and ignore things like grow FTX's market share, yeah, yeah. whatever. That's not a policy goal. That's a SAM goal. Um, uh, from policy goal, I'll give a few examples and then point to what I think sort of the underlying theme of these are. Um, and the first, and this is something I spent a lot of time trying to meditate on, is what happened on the day that all the mobile brokers shut off all retail trading in some tickers, right? The meme stock day where Robinhood, it was known as Robinhood, but actually it's basically everything, every platform like Robinhood, you know, eventually basically froze all the retail customers. Um, why did they freeze it? And um, if you go online, maybe it's a, you'll hear some conspiracy theories. There's no evidence for any of these conspiracy theories. Um, what actually happened was the following. Um, if you go right now to buy a share of Amazon, uh, it takes two days to deliver that share of Amazon to you. And it probably goes through 10 companies. 10's a big number, and you probably don't think of it as going through 10 companies. You think of it as coming from E-Trade or Robinhood. But E-Trade, that's not an exchange. Um, that's not a like clearinghouse for equities. That's, it's not a market maker. It's not an ATS. What is it? It's, it's a broker. It's sort of this like, you know, still-facing website. But secretly, there are 10 different companies that pass this share of Amazon from the ultimate seller to the ultimate buyer. Um, and settlement doesn't happen for 48 hours in equities. So for 48 hours, you bought a share of Amazon, so you think. Your account claims that you bought this share of Amazon, but you're kind of just trusting the fact, hopefully, that none of those 10 players is going to say, oops, sorry, I don't actually have this share of Amazon, and also, I guess I'm bankrupt now, so good luck. Right? Like, that is 
a risk in equities market structure. Um, and that's on the equity side. On the dollar side, um, you have a similar thing where now if it's all happening at one bank, it's, it's a lot cleaner. But if instead you have like credit cards and ACH, which are involved in this, which have 30 day clawbacks sometimes, like you can call up your credit card company two weeks later and say, never mind, I didn't buy that bagel. I did eat it, but I don't want to have bought it, please. All of a sudden, okay, what if it wasn't a bagel? If it's a financial transaction, what if the dollars don't make it? For, so, okay, so you have somewhere between a few days and a few weeks of like uncertainty about whether that purchase happened. Um, and let's say that that stock has gone up 10x in price you know, over the first day, you've quote unquote made $100, right, on your purchase. You bought it for $10, now worth, you know, 100 whatever. But you don't, you're not actually locking that in for a little bit. And there's a lot of parties that could fail in this. And each one of them has to be worried that any other partner will fail. Like every company's worried that every other company fails. So every one of them needs to have regulatory capital, which is basically a giant pot of capital in case someone else fails to deliver what they said they deliver and they can't make their customers whole. Eventually, on this you know, meme stock training day, retail, t retail traders made so much money, they blew through the regulatory capital of the least capitalized players in this chain of players, and then they basically all had to be like at least frozen and maybe liquidated out of fear that if they made any more money, maybe it wouldn't be delivered, and then maybe no one could make them whole. That was, that was a shit show. Like, that, that is not what markets should be. That's not what trading should be. Um, no one thinks that like when you buy a share of Amazon, you don't morally have that share yet. Everyone thinks you have that share of Amazon. And like settlement is not supposed to be a thing you're worried about. Um, but on this day, settlement became such a worry that they had to shut down trading. Um, and uh, on that same day, uh, Dogecoin traded continuously with no problems. And was that because it is a much more financially sound uh, entity than GameStop, you can make your own decisions. Um, it's got a dog on the coin. I don't know how much that helps. Um, the reason is that, and this gets like, what's the vision here? Uh -huh. Settlement on blockchain. Um, if I want to buy a Bitcoin from you, right, how do I know that I'm really going to get that Bitcoin? It's because you send it to me on the blockchain, and like five minutes later, I have it. It's public that I have it, it's on the ledger, it's final. Um, there's no ambiguity about this. No you can intermediaries. Do it. No intermediaries, 24-7. I'm not worrying about some broker I've never heard of. Like, you just send it on the blockchain. It's clean. It works. On the fastest blockchains, in a few seconds, it will have settled. Um, and if you have that settlement system, like a real-time settlement system, all of a sudden, you don't have days or weeks of risk building up in the system with, and you don't need 10 intermediaries to you know, carry a stock from one person to another, right? If you had tokenized stocks and tokenized dollars trading, in theory, okay, I'm sweeping a lot under the rug here right now, right? Like, I'm sweeping all of the challenges, all the problems, all the drawbacks. We're going to get there the very We're soon. We're going to get there. But in theory, right, in some magical land, maybe, um, it could make, for instance, equities settlement cleaner. Um, that is, I think, one of the big promises. And I, I, that's equity settlement, but how about, like, treasuries, right? How about fixed income instruments? How about, like, random... The bonds, you know, a company issues 200 different types of bonds, um, and like, you know, you got ex literally it's Excel spreadsheets flying back and forth between gigantic financial institutions trying to figure out who's traded what and who bought and sold what and reconciling at the end of each day. And you wake up in the morning with like a billion dollars of discrepancies from the previous day that, you know, your accounts are still hashing out. Um, so, okay, so that, that's one sort of like potential promise, which is sort of live in crypto markets right now. Um, a second thing is payments. And you can think of this as buying a bagel. Right now it costs 2% to some payment processor, credit card, something like that. Sending money to a relative in a different country costs 20% and two weeks, and hopefully it doesn't get stolen. Um, and in theory, abstracting away a huge number of realities here, which are real and hard to get through, um, again, a 20th of a penny and two seconds later, and you sent it to anyone in the world. So payments, remittances. And the third one, which we can get into if we have time, is like social media. I, I think there are really cool things with interoperability you can do of information with, with blockchain as well, where basically you can break down this like monopolistic moat where you know, Facebook has exclusive right to all messages that you write on Facebook. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm going to now share the problems I'm aware of. 
Mm -hmm. You may or might not add to that based yep. on your robust desire to make us all understand. So the, the first is this contradiction. When, when people talk about the wonderful benefits Yep. And you just kind of laid out, one of them is like transparency, right? Yep. No intermediaries, two people, there's a ledger. And at the same time, the biggest probably public critique is this secrecy and nefarious uses. And what the heck, right? So is it like you want accountability for government and secrecy for individuals? Or like how do those two things Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's super messy. The narrative is fucked around this. And, and, and the industry, you'll be shocked to hear sometimes picks and chooses which side of this it reports at, at various points. And what's going on here is that actually, is Bitcoin extremely transparent or extremely private? Well, here's what it really is. Um, it's extremely transparent in that you can see every transaction that's ever happened between anyone on the blockchain. It's all public. But you, it's not people's names that you see. It's, it's like, you know, 16-digit strings, right? It's, it's their addresses. And so there's this mapping of person to address, which is private, um, but once you go into the land of addresses, it's all public. And so it, it depends on which way you view it. It depends on what the lens is. Um, the, what does this mean in practice? What this means in practice is that, look at this from, for instance, a financial crimes point of view, right? Like the case where this comes up the most, or one, sorry, there's sort of two cases where this comes up. Basically, one is like creepy surveillance state, and the other is like terrorism, oh. right? And worth just throwing out there that like these are american words different countries might use the freedom fighters <laughs> words to, to refer to, to these same concepts right um but uh in practice what this means is the following um if you know that alice's address is that one right over there then you can see exactly where all the funds came from and went not just one hop but the entire history like you see the whole network laid out in front of you. The whole, you can trace through from start to finish. Now, it's all anonymous, right? But, but you can see what went to there, then there, then there, then there, then there. And so if you can periodically kind of dive in and get real identity associations, it's a really powerful tool for better or for worse, for tracking what happened. Um, if you don't have any of that mapping, though, then, yeah, sure, you can trace what the Bitcoin did in sort of like, you know, 16 character string land. But that tells you absolutely nothing about real people. And so the question is, basically, if you can get footholds um, of, you know, know your customer, then it's actually very transparent and easy to trace through. If you can't get that, then it, it's totally private. Um, and, and so from a, for instance, financial crimes point of view, right, what this means in practice is that, um, you know, all of the sort of like large centralized exchanges like FTX are doing know your customer mm -hmm. uh, on our users. And if there's like a suspected, you know, whatever, uh, sort of illicit um, activity financing, right? And, uh, you know, someone from Treasury reaches out to us about it, right? We can associate, given the, the like, uh, you know, ID information we've collected, um, an address with a user. And then we or they can then trace through where all those funds came from and ended up. And periodically, it might hit another centralized exchange. Then so you can go to them, right, and track down, well, okay, what was the activity that happened there? And so in practice, it's sort of this hub, hub and spokes thing. And what, what does this cash out at? What it cashes out at, it basically, is like if all of the big portals between sort of like blockchain land and the real world are um, doing diligence, or all the big trusted portals are doing diligence, then... Um, you can do quite good tracing from a financial crimes perspective, and it's actually shockingly ineffective to try to launder money through crypto. If you have lots of leaks, if there's lots of exchanges that are offering bank accounts and taking virtual currency and are really falling down on their duty, um, then um, it becomes impossible to trace anything that goes through because those are basically big mixers. Mm -hmm. And... I, and you can money laundering going through. Right, so we're going to get into consolidation and regulation, but according to the good people at CNBC, there are 19,000 different currencies at the moment, which sounds about some right. Of that kind of uh, mixing bowl potential. All right, next one. So I'm kind of an energy guy, and yep. I've just never, you know, I mean, so the mining, crypto mining industry is purported to use as much electricity as the nation of Australia. Mm hmm. WTF, like what, what, why? 
And you know, I'm, I'm, so I understand there's like proof of work and proof of, yep. I don't understand. I'm told there's proof of work yeah. and proof of state and proof That's of state right. uses 1% and they did the merge, which is like the yes. Borg and stuff. Like, why? Well, what's going on here? Okay. So I've got some bad news for you, which is I'm going to use words like proof of work and proof yeah. of stake here. So Just it's unpack them a little bit. But yeah, I'll, I'll try and say a little bit more about what they are. Um, here's what's going on at the base level. You have a blockchain. A blockchain is you know, basically a series of transactions. Um, anyone can add to it, and you can only send your funds. You can't send someone else's funds, obviously. Um, who is sort of like collating the blockchain and validating that these are these aren't like nonsensical transactions, that these are valid. Not, I'm not sending you more Bitcoins than I own. Um, the answer is, well, it, different blockchains have different answers to that question. Uh, but there's some validator type layer of people who are basically, you know, vote on each transaction. And like their duty, so to speak, is just to confirm they're not judging the transaction from like, the only way they're judging it is, is this valid? Like, are, am I only doing things I'm allowed to do? Um, and the question is, who is that group of people, right? How is that determined? One way that you could determine it, which is called proof of work, is that the people who, um, who validate the transactions are people who burn electricity. Um, that's not how it's framed, but that is, that is what it cashes out to. What it actually is, is it's you are a validator to the extent that you solve math problems. You get a bunch of random arbitrary math problems, and the more you solve, the more you get to be the person who validates the network. How do you solve math problems? Well, you just have a computer do it. But like a lot, so many math problems that like one computer is not important here. It's thousands of computers. Um, so many computers that they start using real electricity. And it's actually not surprising that they do. Because if it were super cheap, someone else would just come and do it bigger. right? Until it starts costing real money, you're going to competition. And why is anyone doing this? There's an incentivization for it. Basically, you have to pay some money to, to you know, it's an auction, effectively, to send a, a, a transfer or a payment. And you're paying the validators to do this. And so some fraction of the value of the network is getting paid to validators. And you know, however much demand there is to use Bitcoin, a decent fraction of that gets paid to, the, you know, to these validators. And they compete to earn these rewards by doing a lot of math problems, i.e. burning a lot of energy, flowing through computers and fan. Really, I think the fans maybe take more energy than the, the actual compute does, but whatever. So, so what you have is, what this cashes out to is a world where a decent fraction of the economic value, whatever, the sort of market determined economic value of this network um, ends up going into uh, electricity. Massive computer farm. That's right. Um, that is proof of work. And there are a bunch of proof of work um, sort of like ways, ways you can do it. But in practice, Bitcoin is proof of work. It is the biggest, um, obviously, cryptocurrency. And it is the only extremely large cryptocurrency at this point that is proof of work. So this is not true three months ago, the merge, um, but, but it is true now. So at this point, proof of work to first order is basically synonymous with Bitcoin um, from like a quantitative point of view. Another way that you could say who gets to validate these transactions, who gets the fees, is you say, we, we minted some tokens. There are 10,000 tokens. Each token is one vote. And you just have a token holder vote, you know? And there's like the Solana token, or the Avalanche token, or the Ethereum token. And like everyone just gets together, or whatever, you can delegate your vote to, if you don't want to bother voting. Um, and with this system, there's no way to turn electricity into votes. Um, right? It's instead just like token ownership. And so, you, so it doesn't have this like, you know, bleed to electricity burning. Because of that, and this gets to that, that sort of like thing you alluded to, the entire energy usage thing, it's a proof of work thing. Proof of stake just doesn't have that property. Um, and so it used to be basically split between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Ethereum just changed completely to be proof of stake a month or two ago. So it's no longer burning much electricity. So now basically it's all Bitcoin. Um, so uh, that, that sort of is the background for this. Um, and here's a statement that I feel comfortable making. And many people might feel comfortable making more stronger statements than this. But here's what I think probably everyone can agree on. Um, Right now, Bitcoin, by various estimates, is taking, I don't know, a third of a percent of the world's energy or something like that. I don't know exactly what the number is. Whatever. Let, let's pretend that that's the ballpark of this, right? Um, whatever you think about that, if, you, if you're excited for a world in which blockchain starts to get mass adoption and goes from something that like a few percent of the world uses to 
um, you know, something 20 times that or 50 times that uses, right, you probably are going to be nervous, maybe more than nervous, about scaling up that energy usage number, right? We don't want to be in a world where half the world's energy supply is going to mining Bitcoin, right? Like that, at the very least, would be like a sort of like giant global scale problem. Tragic. Yeah. Right. And so here's the good news. Okay, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. That won't happen. I feel quite confident. Even if, hypothetically, no one cared about global warming, even if that was like just not, we forgot about it, right? Just think about the economics here, right? Like Energy costs. Yeah, energy costs. Like, literally, people would be spending half their disposable income on it. So, which is to say that, like, it is economically ridiculous to attempt to take a proof-of-work network and send half the world's financial transactions through that network. It just, it would cost an astronomical amount. Um, and also, have, you know, lots of, of other, so, so that won't happen for economic reasons. What will happen instead, uh, and we've seen this shift happen an enormous amount already, is that the high throughput use cases are all going to proof of stake, um, which is, doesn't have this property. And so we're not seeing growth um, nearly to the same extent in the proof of work um, validation sort of like uh, energy going in as, as we do in, in the proof of stake uses. Now, it's not expensive to sit there holding a Bitcoin. This doesn't mean that like Bitcoins can't exist. Um, and in fact, you can wrap it on other blockchains. You could use a layer two, you could use the lightning network. There are lots of ways to synthetically move a Bitcoin around. Um, what it just means is that we can't have two million transactions per second trying to go through the Bitcoin blockchain um, or proof of work blockchains in general. Um, you know, the, the sort of like vast bulk of that is gonna have to go through proof of stake. So as kind of a climate guy, what I'm interpreting you saying is fundamentally economics will shift this, which does yep. tend to happen, but rational economic activity does not always move smoothly. Right. So I think there's the friction challenge that we're all going to be paying attention to as we Absolutely. Go. And I'm not trying, I don't want to make too strong of a statement yep. here. You know, um, I just want to say it's bounded how, how, how much of a cost that can get to. All right, now I want to start to get towards the regulatory questions through the lens of consumer protection. Yep. So look, my view on this, like many, is this was something for like, you know, just brilliant math geeks and people who had ideas of the world that were just disruptively different from my suburban lifestyle and whatevs. And then all of a sudden, like, Matt Damon, Larry David, Tom Brady all started telling me that like I was an old loser and even though I didn't understand this, if I wanted to be like a vibrant, vital, dynamic person, like I got to get some of this stuff. Even though I had no idea what it was, trust me, I'm Tom Brady. That to me felt like you were changing the market profile in a way that makes the government, you know, the buyer beware was no longer a really kind of credible premise. Like what, what happened there? So a bunch of things happened at once there. And um, I, let, me, let me give a few different approaches to that. Um, the first is talking about uh, from a, this is not, this only partially addresses what you're saying. It's okay. But there's a distinction between marketing, oh, I don't know what the, the words we use internally, internally for this are marketing and branding. Um, as far as we can tell, and maybe we're just bad at this, um, all those things drive very few people. They were funny. They're funny, right? So, ra like, raise your hand if you have seen one of those things referenced, right? Like Matt Damon or Larry David or Tom Brady talking about crypto. Raise your hand if, um, because of one of those, you have yourself bought crypto. This is a pretty typical reaction, and we see this with our user data. The incremental user count from, from that is, like, close to zero. Um, Did you just want to meet Larry David? Like, wh 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 why? <laughs> it's, um, uh, it turns out he's actually very similar in person to on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. So it's, I mean. You've already met him. Yeah. Um, no, um, uh, it's what it does, and this is getting sort of a corporate perspective, not a policy perspective. Um, uh, it's much, much more about our branding and uh, as a company and the institutional relationships that we can create than it is about mass market activity, which is, I think, counterintuitive. Um, it would not have felt that way to me at the beginning. 
Uh, but in practice, um, that's actually something which is much more aimed at institutional relationships. Um, and it's a foot in the door, is what it really is. It's a like, please stop like declining our meeting requests and like have the meeting so that we can talk about mm -hmm. a way we could potentially maybe work together mm -hmm. is sort of like the core thing that, that like that would, at least from our perspective, I, I, I don't know for sure what crypto.com was thinking, but like that, that's what we're thinking. All of that being said though, like while, while he's a little counterintuitive with what like those things in particular did, um, that doesn't change the fact that like in general, um, a lot more people got involved in crypto, right? Like, and, and, and some retail did, a fair bit of retail did. And so one of those people is like Gary Gensler, right? So yep. you may have precipitated this moment, but um, everybody kind of wants a piece of this, right? So you have like the you know, FSOC, right? Which is in premise, like the nation's coordinated financial universe, putting out a share document, which they almost never, they almost never read anything. And you know, the, about a week ago, they pretty much kind of said like, crypto could be a threat to the global financial. It was almost like the systemically important financial institution. Like you're almost like the industry is like a SIFI. Right. And that's like game on for the government. SEC, CFTC, controller of the currency, they're coming for this. Yep. And so is that necessary? Is that good? Talk about the so premise of regulation. I think it is in principle necessary and good. And in practice, I'm optimistic that it will be. Um, I think that, like, um, basically, I think that, first of all, crypto is big enough and, you know, uh, starting to touch enough things that it is important to have regulatory oversight. Maybe, maybe that had been true for a while. Whether or not it had been true for a while, I think there are arguments. Maybe it should have been true a, a little bit before it, it did become true. Um, it is certainly true now. And Government uh, usually leads from behind. <laughs> it's... It's a tough task, right? Like, I mean, for, you know, it's always frustrating to see it going slowly from our perspective. And then we remember there's like, you know, a war in Ukraine and like, you know, a few other things that like that same government has to deal with. And, you know, we are not the only thing that they get to spend their time on. So I, I, I sympathize uh, with having multiple things pulling at, 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 at your attention here as a government. Um, but um, but it's certainly, at, certainly now at, is at the point where like, from many angles, I think regulatory oversight is healthy. Um, and like to give a few different, you know, takes on this, like, um, uh, first of all, just like, you know, just the base level stuff and like the cleanest example that I think you can talk about, like the single clearest example is stable coin reserves. This is like, so what is a stable coin? A stable coin, I'm gonna ignore algorithmic stable coins and, and shit like that. I'm gonna talk Please about like, the most boring stable coin that you can imagine, USDC, USDP, Paxos and Circles, or Circles and Paxos is stable coins. What is it? You have a billion dollars in a bank account and a billion stable coins. And you say it's one to one, and you can redeem a stable coin and we'll wire the dollar to you, or you can wire us a dollar and we'll mint you a stable coin, right? And the whole point is that it gets you effectively a dollar on the blockchain. Like it, it sort of like is a thing which is fixed at a price of a dollar, but which you can settle like a token. Mm -hmm. um, super, super useful. Um, uh, right now, the regulatory oversight of them is extremely unclear. Um, it's, it's extremely messy, and there are a lot of cooks, I would say, hovering around the kitchen, but there's no head chef. Um, so in a traditional financial, so, you think about it like a reserve margin, right? And, and, right, and like, what's the core thing here? What's the single most important thing? Well, how about like, are there at least as many dollars as there are tokens, right? Like, if you have, if you're saying this is stable coin back one to one by the dollar, and there are a billion dollars in a bank account and five billion tokens, you have a problem, right? Like, you can't redeem all those tokens for a dollar. Um, there's a run on the bank risk. And there's, I mean, every sort of risk you'd imagine, risk is almost not the right word, reality. Like, reality is bad. It's not just like a tail of risk that will be bad. You're, you're fucked if you get there. So, like, so, like, there are lots of other things you could do. But at the very, very least, a completely straightforward thing to do would be to have like regulatory oversight ensuring that there are always at least as many dollars in the bank account backing these stable coins as there are stable coins in circulation such that they are meaningfully backed one to one and then also oversight that like redemptions are allowed that like you know it sort of like is being handled in a proper manner whatever there's sort of like lots of sort of like not doing fraud things around the edge that you want to do as well 
there are lots of sort of like advanced things you could try and regulate as well there, but, but I think like step one is like let's at least ensure that. One of these advanced things you can think about is what if it's not backed by dollars? What if it's backed by like assets with some volatility? You got some dollars, you got some bitcoins in there, maybe some stocks. And now you start talking about like, okay, what's the volatility of that profile? How much could it decrease? What's the reserve requirement? Okay, that, that's sort of like, let's even push that aside for a second. Basically you're saying like the regulation could help to make sure that people can actually back up right, exactly. transactions. At the very least, right? Like, and, and sort of like there's a lot more that you could go to, but like that's like a clean place to start where like right now there basically isn't any core regulator who clearly has the duty to ensure that for stable coins and like there should be. Um, and I think like industry agrees, consumers agree, government agrees, Congress agrees. Um, and that's like the cleanest example I can think of a like pure win to have regulatory oversight um, of this. And um, I, what are other things? I mean, just generally ensuring transparency. Ensure, like there are lots of harder questions about like what type of asset should even theoretically be allowed. But even before you get to that, at the very least, every asset should have to describe accurately what it is should not be allowed to overrepresent mm -hmm. what it does. Um, and, you know, platforms should be held to that standard. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at, like, order books, right, like, it, it should be, like, I think an agnostic order book where everyone's bid is treated equally and you don't have, like, you know, the sort of, like, you know, I don't know, the, the like, big boys who get, like, cool bids that, like, jump in front of everyone else's or, whatever else you might worry about there, right? Like the kind of oversight that you have of markets, like there's really parallel things, anti-market manipulation oversight, right? Translates pretty cleanly over to this. Anti just like scams, right? Like the like click here to get like a boat and actually it's just you can give them money is, is what happens if you click there. You don't get the boat. Um, like that, that should not be so allowed. It sounds like, you know, look, so at a starting point, honesty, legitimacy, yes. transparency, and this, uh, this is my last question, then we're going to open it up to the audience, particularly if we have any kind of credential media, you all get to go first. FTX is a big company, got some resources, you're buying some other things yep. that have potential but seem to have failed. You know, one of the key things that regulation usually does is it kind of consolidates. And you know, I'm going to California today, first time in three years. You know, I'm flying on a name brand airline, like I didn't want to go like Bob's airline, you yep. don't go to like, you know, Jimmy's brain surgeon. But People do seem to, like, wow, there's like a cool picture on that coin. Is it, gonna, is it good to have that universe shrink down? Or is that anti-democratic? Like, what, is there a right, right number of cryptocurrencies? So I feel super conflicted on that. Let, let me give if you... I mean, is this is like an antitrust question. I know you have people in the audience. Well, you can... <laughs> I mean, let me give you first the thing I feel comfortable saying. But then there's a lot of areas where I really do think it's important and unclear, which is that there should be some consolidation because you should get rid of the bad actors. You should get rid of the scams, right? That causes – Bob's airline probably crashes a lot. Yeah, that was my fear. And so it's like, yes, like you should not be allowed to take Bob's airline. They shouldn't be allowed to try and fly you. So like to that extent, the consolidation enforced by regulation is, is good for the world. Now there's a second type of consolidation, which sometimes comes from regulation, which is that it – becomes really logistically burdensome and expensive to run a business, not because you need to do that to protect customers, but you need to do that because now you need to have a large lobbying team if you want to have a regulated business. And that can cause a type of consolidation I don't think is super healthy, where it just, like, like practically speaking, becomes implausible for many new entrants to create real competition in the space Balancing those two is not very easy because you can't easily, usually, you can't easily and seamlessly ensure that everything that's happening is above board without incurring some burden on companies that only some legitimate companies will be able to hit. And so there is a tension there, and there's a similar tension with the token where, okay, it's great that you get rid of the scams. Clearly good, right? But now you get to questions of, like, how about just, like, a kind of, like, lighthearted token that doesn't have much backing, but isn't claiming that, isn't over-promoting itself, but like, is, doesn't have $2 million to spend mm -hmm. on legal fees to go through a registration like BPC process. coin. Like, yeah. It's, I, I like, that's the point where I start to feel myself pretty conflicted about what the right policy is. And I mean, look, you try and strike the best balance you can, but like, I, I, like, one of my biggest, like, 
in general, I'm very excited that there's more regulation for crypto. I think it's a great thing. That's one of the things that I like have a little bit of hesitation around. So I'm loving this, and I got a lot more questions, but consistent with the theme of democratization, um, anybody from the media want to ask a question first? Yep, please, and let us know who you are. Sure, yeah, I'm Camilla Ray, Camilla Ray. Um, I guess I know you mentioned the FSOC report. Oh, let's get um, you a microphone. Well, thank you. I know you mentioned the FSOC report. One of the things they said in there was that, you know, a crypto firm acting as, you know, a, a clearinghouse, a broker dealer is a potential threat to financial Just stability. Just hypothetical crypto firm. Right, right. Yeah. They didn't mention anyone by no. name. Um, Hard to know. It sounds like you might disagree with that, so I'm just wondering why. So I think what I would say is that I have very particular views on it, and I think that, like, some specific versions of it um, have serious concerns, and others, I think you need to have regulatory oversight to ensure that it's done in a healthy way, but if so, then I think there are efficiencies from it. So to, to give a little bit more sort of like nuance to that, like um, I, you know, here's an area where, um, frankly, a lot of players in the crypto industry have to grapple with how to handle this right now, but I think that having like regulatory guardrails on this that at least ensure transparency. Um, how about like exchange listing decisions? and exchange VC arm investment decisions, right? At the very least, I think like, you know, having some standard of transparency around that um, out of a worry of conflicts of interest seems like a kind of healthy thing. And that's not like, look, there's lots of details to flesh out there. Um, an example of a thing where like, um, I think that I, I feel like kind of nervous is, and, and that, that like as a regulator, I'd be pretty nervous, is something that looks like a uh, single dealer broker, something where only one company is allowed to provide liquidity. Um, and there are lots of ways you can instrument that. You could, some dark pools are effectively that. Um, but like, you know, in general, like one of the things order books usually say is like anyone can provide liquidity and then you get, in theory, the best market price, right? Because the customer comes to buy and they get the lowest offer of anyone who wants to offer that asset. If you say only one person can offer it, then like there's no competition. Who knows what price they're going to get? There's a conflict of interest there. Um, PFOF obviously is something which like can run into this problem depending on how it's implemented. Um, that's an area where like I would be, be taking a hard look as a regulator around whether you want to just mandate agnostic order books or if it's not an agnostic open providing order book, like do a real hard dive into like is this being done in like a responsible way that is healthy for customers. Um, putting that aside though, what are cases where I think that it, with the correct regulatory oversight, um, can be totally fine? Um, I don't think that um, that intermediation is a sort of base good. Um, I think it can make sense in some contexts, but I think it can increase risk in a lot of contexts if you're not careful. And, you know, if as a regulator you say, that in order to access this platform, you have to go through a third party firm as an intermediary. Like, what is the goal of that exactly? Because there's one more firm that can fail. There's one more firm that can screw over the customer somehow. There's one more firm that can reduce information, reduce transparency, and increase fees and cost to the end consu consumer. And in many cases, that's fine because they're providing great value there. I don't want to like ban the concept of intermediation. Like, I think people choose intermediaries often for a good reason. Um, but I think like consumer choice is a kind of good proxy to use there. Like people should use an intermediary if it's what gives them the better experience and not otherwise. It's sort of like how, how I like, again, I'm not making a claim about how the law is written right now. I'm making sort of like a, a claim about like how I would think about designing something here. And so, but, so I, I think that like optionally disintermediated systems um, have a lot of advantages to consumers with one giant caveat, um, which a lot of people brought up and is absolutely right, which is that if you have, and there are lots of language, ways to use language for this, but something like an exchange, which is also a broker, you have to make sure that you don't forget that there are various customer protections on the broker level that you now need to apply to the exchange level, right? Like if you had lots of like things that were meant to protect retail consumers, but you just assumed that some entity wasn't gonna face retail consumers, and so you hadn't yet like written the comparable language for that, you have to make sure that if it is facing retail, that it has all the same requirements from a customer protections 
perspective that you know the traditional intermediary would have and that there's a regulator who is like in charge of ensuring that that is the case and so there shouldn't be a way to like reduce customer protection um, you know it shouldn't be sort of like a backdoor for that um, but as long as you're doing that in a diligent way I think it can just like make better experiences and lower risk experiences for customers in some cases. Unfortunately, the question that you hadn't thought about much was uh, the original pose. Um, thank you. We have another question. Uh, Allie from Bloomberg News. Kind of piggybacking off of that question, are you finding the concerns about vertical integration in the FSOC report, are you finding that they are causing issues with your application with the CFTC for, you know, margined crypto derivatives trading? Um, well, speaking as a CFTC commissioner, um, I'm, I'm not a CFTC commissioner. I, you know, I can't speak on behalf of the CFTC, so I, I won't try and claim what they think. I'll tell you, um, from a high-level perspective, um, I would be optimistic that the, uh, the way that I would sort of read that, you know, were I to be a regular, which I am absolutely not, would be, like, acknowledged we have to make sure that we are applying the same standards of customer protection here as would happen in any other case. And, you know, one of the first things that we did when we were putting together our, our um, you know, application with the CFTC was make sure, you know, do a deep dive into exactly what customer protections exist at the FCM layer and make sure that we had um, a stronger version of that that was baked in to anything that, you know, customers would be interfacing, um, you know, with for, for the platform. So make sure that we did port over all of those things. And so, like, Whatever, I'm not a regulator. Everyone can, you know, make make their their judgments on ways. But my interpretation of it is like, um, you know, make sure that that's not a backdoor for um, dodging regulation. And you know, I don't think it is in our case. I think we have a higher standard of customer protection built in than you know we, we've seen on a lot of FCMs. But um, you know, it's not my judgment call at the end of the day. So. Um, I haven't gotten that indication in particular, but I you know, don't know if I would get that indication. So, yeah. right, Two more questions. Hey, uh, Jesse Hamilton at uh, Coindesk. Uh, you've become one of the uh, <clears throat> major uh, 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 campaign donors. Uh, what's, your, what's your current thinking about donating uh, to uh, the congressional races, the federal races in the U.S.? So, um, in keeping with the forum that we are at today, um, I think in a way which I hadn't necessarily appreciated as much historically, um, I've, like, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, like, I, I've, um, I think, increasingly come to view bipartisanship and kind of constructive working together as one of the most important things in Washington, and that, um, I, that, you know, policy disagreements are what they are, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't try to work together where we agree. And any way that I can help support, the, you know, fostering a culture of bipartisan, um, you know, constructive compromise and progress, as opposed to partisan bickering, um, I think it is uh, is super important. And, and that's sort of like the the thing on the sort of like well anti-partisan side, I guess. Um, and then the other thing is just pandemics is. You know, I, I think there's a broad consensus that it would be good to prevent pandemics. I think that there is not a broad consensus that there are enough people who are going to put in that work to make that happen. Um, and that's around the policy side as well, that like having people who will make sure to follow through on common sense things to try to not have what happened to us over the last few years happen again, except maybe way more deadly if we get less lucky. Um, I, I like, yeah, having people who will actually champion that, I think, is, is super important. Last question. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, Tanya Evans, I'm from the academia side, so Penn State Dickinson Law School, co-hire at the Penn State Institute for Computational and Data Sciences. When I teach blockchain crypto in the law, I teach it from a, an economic justice and social justice point of view, and so as we work through going from Web 2 to Web 3 in that environment, thinking about from a regulatory and policy perspective, in, in ensuring the access and inclusion that is missing from where we yeah. are so we have a different future. Your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that, like, I'm optimistic about blockchain for that. I don't think it's a fait accompli. Like, I think we could still screw it up and, and end up with all the exclusion that we found in traditional finance if we're not careful. 
Um, and and to, to maybe, you know, hash that out a, a little bit, um, I, which are, I mean, when we engage with policymakers, when we engage with congressmen, like, which are the congressmen who intuitively understand most immediately how crypto works and how it can be used? Um, is it the most tech savvy, like, you know, representatives? Yep, that's part of it. That's not the only predictor, though. Like, it's a weird space where, like, tech savvy, rural and minority are all predictors of it. And really, if you put the tech side to the side for this second, people who have been historically not given equitable access to financial ecosystems, I think often have a much more vivid and detailed and practical understanding of where blockchain could be useful. And um, which is to say that I think it has a lot of promise there. Um, if you think about like overdraft fees, right? Like overdraft fees are not a thing you have to worry about if you have an extra million dollars in your bank account. It's like whatever, you've got a huge buffer. If you don't have that, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, right? When will that paycheck hit? Who knows? You've got a weak uncertainty. You tried to cash something out. When will that happen? Who knows? Will those line up correctly or will you go below zero briefly? Who knows? Um, and these are exactly the cases where it's most painful to have to pay that fee. If you, and so, whatever, that's sort of one random example. But a lot of this does come down to basically settlement being kind of shitty. And like having clean settlement with blockchain could make it really easy and straightforward for people to actually manage their finances um, correctly. Um, and like I know I have to hire a team of people to interface successfully with a single bank account. Um, I don't think most people get to hire a team of people to manage their bank account. Um, and uh, and so I, th I think it's enormous potential. And sort of one other side of this is, um, you know, we've handled a lot of uh, aid to Ukraine and worked with the Ukrainian government. And I think like if you talk about like where do you need a global, digital, decentralized uh, financial system that can be accessed on on, on a mobile phone, um, when there are tanks outside your banks, is like a pretty clean example of that, right? Um, so uh, so I think it's a ton of potential and. How could we screw it up? Like, how could we end up in a world where, despite that, we end up in the same place? Um, if we say, sure, there's blockchain, but in order to do anything on blockchain, you need to first go through exactly all the processes that you need to do to use a traditional financial ecosystem. We've just baked all the exclusion back into it, right? And like, if if we say that, like, in one way that I think about this is whitelist versus blacklist, is um, absolutely important to have blacklists for. Um, you know, addresses associated with financial crimes, um, you know, on blockchains. Um, it doesn't need to be a technological blacklist necessarily, um, but at least a blacklist that all of the um, major hubs and institutions respect so that in practice you can freeze out assets if they fall into Al Qaeda's hands, right? Like, um, makes a ton of sense. And, um, and so, totally in favor of having blacklisted addresses. If you flip that, to a whitelisted system where you can only access digital finance if you get an explicit thumbs up from the government to do so, right? I'm going to be okay, I think, because I can probably hire enough people to do whatever I need to do to get the government to spend whatever time it needs to decide, yes, I can have access to finance or something, right? But you look at the people who are currently underserved and, like, are they going to be able to get that level of attention, even to, to be whitelisted and all the, like, who knows? So if you start Probably. with the presumption of exactly. good access. You start with the presumption of, of freedom and then restricting cases of bad activity, I think is super healthy. Start with the presumption that you can only do anything if it gets an explicit thumbs up and all the marginalized groups are going to be marginalized once again. So I have a final question. So imagine. In a hypothetical world, you're invited to like an FSOC meeting, and you have Secretary of Treasury, SEC, CFTC, and you have like two minutes. What do you want them to know? Like, what's the most essential thing that you would want to share with the government overlords who you are seeking to interact with? Yeah, hypothetically. Speaking. Hypothetically speaking. Um, um, I think there may have been a speech from an FSOC member about document they had submitted to FSOC recently. I don't think he agreed with all of it. Um, um, I, no, um, <laughs> um, I, made the lawyers nervous. Um, the, uh, 
I think what I'd say is the following things. First of all, we are uh, totally on board with regulation. It has to happen. It's healthy. Um, it's the right thing to do. Um, and uh, uh, we'd love to be helpful any way we can in you know, providing whatever information is, is helpful for that. Um, and we think there needs to be more, you know, more consumer protection, more financial risk oversight um, you know, of the industry. Um, that would just be thing one. And, and, and in some sense, that, whatever, it's a thing I say a lot, but I think it's just like I can't say it enough. Like it's just like partially because I think um, our industry has not always done a great job at saying that. Um, sometimes that has, um, I, maybe that was the intention, but it's come out more like fuck you. And that, that wasn't as constructive a way to engage. And so. There's people who can help with that translation. Right, yeah, that's right. So, um, so that, that's, uh, that's one thing. But the, the other thing that I would say is, and look, obviously everyone can make their, their own decisions. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't presume to speak on behalf of what FSOC would think would be right here. But I thing I would say would be like, there's so much potential ground here. You know, we're never going to get to perfection, and we're never going to foresee everything that will happen, but there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Let's start with the low-hanging fruit. Let's put one foot in front of the other here. And I think, like, again, I use stable coins a lot as an example because I think it's just the cleanest. It's just, like, the clearest, clearly a good thing which helps reduce risk. To do this without getting in the way of legitimate finance, it's just good. Let's do that. And there are a bunch of other things that are sort of like on that low hanging fruit level of like, you know, clearly can help reduce risk and protect consumers without um, putting that much of a dent in sort of legitimate uh, financial uh, use cases. And, um, you know, there are going to be hard decisions to make eventually. There are going to be contentious decisions. There are things where I feel conflicted and don't know what the right answer is. Um, there are a lot of these. When you start to get into DeFi, there's a lot of really interesting policy questions, which I don't think there is a consensus on exact, there's a consensus on um, some things which are not the way to handle it, but I don't think there's a consensus on exactly what the right policy is. Um, and we will have to get to that um, eventually, but like, let's not nerd snipe ourselves with that too much at the beginning. Let's take care of the things that we can take care of um, that can help reduce risk and protect consumers. And we can iterate as this goes, but. Um, let's, let's start with a little hanging fruit, put one foot in front of the other. So Sam, this has been terrific. And I have learned a lot. There are a lot of phrases that I now need to go Google. Nerd snipe, I think, is a <laughs> kind of cool one that I might use myself. But really, really appreciate your thoughtfulness and um, openness. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you.